Well, we've got some technical problems, technological issues. So, what I would have played for you is the voice, the 1930 voice, of a woman by the name of Salima Pasha, who changed her name. It was a Jewish Turkish name because the Turks um, were in control of Iraq at the time, but she changed her name to Salima Murad because when the government changed and they became much more nationalistic, they wanted her to have a Muslim name. Why was it important for them to have Salima's name as a Muslim name? Because she was the most popular singer in Iraq. She was so popular, more popular than Madonna, and she lasted longer than Madonna. In fact, she stayed in Iraq well after the Jews had exited. And she sang a song, the song I really wanted you to hear, was by a Jewish writer, a Jewish songwriter, by the name of Yusuf Zarar. And why am I telling you this? Why? Um, because if you remember, in the book of Daniel in the Bible, in the year 597 BCE, when the Jewish captives, please turn off your phones. No, they didn't have phones in 597 BCE. Um, anyway, when the Jewish captives were taken to Babylon by King Nebuchadnezzar, we are told they wept by the waters of Babylon. They were miserable. The King Nebuchadnezzar said to them, why in the world are you miserable? You're wailing. You are in the New York of the Middle East. And you cry for that backwater Jerusalem. We are now about to eat. Would you please take out your instruments and play? So what's fascinating is that those musicians, musicians brought from Jerusalem, most of them were musicians. The Jews who came were musicians. And what is fascinating, that 2,600 years later, when the Jews were expelled from Iraq, 180,000 Jews between 1950 and 1951 airlifted to Israel. The majority of them were musicians. <coughs> Nothing had changed. And Iraqi music industry fell on its face when they left. And you'll hear later, not only the Iraqi music industry, but every other, just about every other industry collapsed when the Jews left. That exodus spelled the end of a way of life for Jewish people that had continued unchanged, basically, for two and a half thousand years. And like the reverberations of a thunderclap, it led to the displacement of one million Jewish refugees throughout the Middle East and North Africa. And it spelled the end of the music in every sense of the word. That is the voice of Salima Pasha singing Yusuf Zarul's song. She's, of course she's singing in Arabic. The Jews filled the music industry. If you, at that time, in the 1930s, and uh, I, 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 I heard the song and I remembered my late aunt's to I, Zipporah and Ali Bracha, because she had a fabulous singing voice and she used to sing that song. And when I heard it, I nearly wept. I saw it on YouTube. Now this is the Holocaust Center. It's a monument to six million Jewish people. And I have to tell you from the start, as much as possible when I wrote this talk, I didn't want to say Jews. I don't like to hear the word Jews because people forget we're people. So please try. And it's not always easy, we, but we do, we do it. We say Jews, but as much as possible to say Jewish people. So this center is a monument to six million Jewish people who perished under the Nazi regime. And it is a really neat number. And it's pretty accurate as the Germans were fastidious record keepers. In Iraq, K 
accounting and record keeping was haphazard. My late mother, Sabina Jawari, Zifranada Brahma, was born in Baghdad. We don't know the date. She was born at home. And all she knew was that she was born on the second <coughs> night of Hanukkah. So this photograph on the right is the only documentary proof that we have of her birth. She's sitting on my grandmother's lap as a baby, her older brother Sabir next to her, and it, it was the only proof that my grandmother had to prove to her husband, who was in India doing business, that he had a baby daughter, and would you please come home? <laughs> For about four or five years later, she had to take another photograph. This time he was doing business in Paris. Look, you have a family. But Iraq was like that. You were born, you died, when, where. It really didn't matter. You didn't count. Okay. People's lives, their stories, washed away with desert sands, and nobody took any notice. But of course it was different in Germany. So why am I talking about this event, the Farhud, in the Holocaust Center? The word Farhud is Arabic for anarchy. And it refers to the massacre of the Jewish people of Iraq on the eve of Shavuot. So this would have been a good talk to give you on Shavuot. The Feast of Weeks. And I hope that the information is repeated every Shavuot from here on to eternity. Feast of Weeks, June 1st and 2nd, 1941. It was precipitated by the coup of the Nazi sympathizer Rashid Ali on April the 1st, 1941. When I told people I was talking about the Farhood today, they said, what? Even my brother in America said, the what? Wikipedia calls it a pogrom, but a Russian Yiddish word doesn't fit. Edwin Black, whose book you see here calls it the crystal nut of Baghdad. Should it be a German word? Iraqi records tell us 200 people were killed, Jewish people. British records say upward of 600, and the Babylonian Heritage Center says it was over 800, with only 180 identified, and the rest thrown into a mass grave and denied a ritual burial. That takes no account of the mutilations, the rapes, the theft of children, young girls, looting, destruction, property. And it happened as a, as a direct result of a Nazi plan to rid the Middle East of Jewish people. So why don't we talk about it? Part of the reason is that six million overwhelms. And the assumption by European Jewry has always been that the Middle Eastern Jews had it easy. And they didn't experience the Holocaust. What's a few hundred compared to six million? But the Farhud did not arise in a vacuum. And Edwin Black, this writer, insists it should be recognized as part of the Holocaust. And maybe figures need to be somewhat adjusted. On this book cover, we see the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, Amin al Husseini, meeting with Hitler. And below it, he's inspecting Libyan troops who were dressed in German-style uniform. Look at their helmets, rounded helmets. My mother told me that as a family, they used to switch on the radio each morning. And suddenly, one morning in 1933, they heard the German words, Achtung, Achtung. And this went on for nearly a decade. <coughs> so let's take a step back. Okay, I wasn't born in Baghdad. I was born here. My parents were strongly Iraqi, heavily imbued with Judeo-Babylonian culture. And when I was at home, I was in little Baghdad. And when I left the house each day, I became an Aussie. What was magical? What was this magical place that my parents talked of all the time called Iraq? Now, dripping with oil, beleaguered by the Americans, the Australians, the Europeans, and ISIS. Mesopotamia, the land between the two rivers, the Fertile Crescent, source of civilization. Um, you can see on this map, <coughs> the very outside line on the right of the border of Iraq with Iran. Then you have two central lines, 
and they are the Tigris on the right, the Euphrates on the left. Um, on the Tigris, you can see Baghdad, and just below it is perched the shrine of Ezra the scribe. On Shavuot, you would travel down the river from Baghdad on the Tigris on the right. This is the shrine of, shrine of Ezra. Then go further down, cross over to the Euphrates, and you would go up to the shrine of Ezekiel. The trip took about five days, and it is estimated that 5,000 Jewish pilgrims visited each year. It was from the land between the two rivers that Abraham set out to the land of Canaan and had his most insightful vision that God is one and unknowable. It was a vision that influenced the rise of Christianity and then Islam, and they are still fighting us for ownership of that original vision. When the Jewish people came to Babylon as captives, it was the first time in history that we as a Jewish people were suddenly a people without a land. But we flourished there. Babylonia, as it was called, became a center of Jewish learning, lasted for over a thousand years. And the Talmud, we know it comes from Babylonia. Babylonia was the first place in which Jewish prayers were written in a language other than Hebrew. The lingua franca in that region was Aramaic. So Jews moved from speaking their Hebrew of <coughs> Jerusalem to Aramaic of their new home. And the Kaddish, which we read today, is written in Aramaic. It comes to us all the way from Babylonia. What you would see, and you might still see, is a picture, a photograph from 1932 of the shrine of Ezekiel, which I mentioned, which sits on that river Tigris. It's in the village of al -Shifl. You can see the Jewish people of the village standing in front of it, and they look like Arabs. You wouldn't know that they were Jews. Ezekiel was deported to Tel Aviv in Babylonia along with his compatriots at the sacking of Jerusalem in the 6th century. And while in Jerusalem, he preached gloom and gloom for the sins of Israel, in Babylonia, he preached a magic message of hope and a return to the land. Ezekiel's promise to return to the land finally came true in 1950-51 to with the expulsion of the Jews from Iraq. And this shrine is believed by both Muslims and Jews to be his tomb. Its story reflects the story of the Jewish people of Iraq. Why? Well, I am only showing you in this picture half a picture. Okay. I painted this image 15 years ago. It's based on information I got from an old black and white postcard and from stories my mother had told me. And it encapsulates the life of Jewish people in Iraq. We are on the Euphrates in the village called El Shifl, the shrine of Ezekiel to the right. It is a most ancient and unusual building. Its dome structure is unlike anything known worldwide. It's not a ziggurat. It's not a pyramid. It's not a circular dome. It's not an onion-shaped dome. It is not a tower, and it is very, very old. The Arabs recognized it as being something really special, and they tussled with the Jews over its ownership for centuries. They claimed it as the tomb of one of their own minor prophets, whom they melded, melded with Ezekiel. The shrine changed hands back and forth, back and forth, like a seesaw, <coughs> Jewish, Muslim, Jewish, Muslim, Jewish, now Muslim. In the 14th century, when it passed yet again into Jewish hands, the Muslims built a mosque next to it, the building on the left. But they made sure to build a minaret that was higher than Ezekiel's dome. And then it fell out of hands, uh, out of Jewish hands for some time. And in the mid 19th century, returned to Jews under the Ottomans, who had no love for the local Shiites of Chippewa. It wasn't because they loved the Jews. With the rise of Nazi influence in Iraq, the shrine eventually fell into Muslim hands, and the Hebrew lettering that was inscribed on the inside of the shrine was effaced and replaced with Arabic writing. 
So the night with the Jews in the night was like that. One day good, one day bad, one day good, one day bad, depending on the leadership. Oh, amen. Okay. At the turn of the 20th century, there were about 50,000 Jewish people in Baghdad, comprising over a quarter of the total population of Baghdad itself. The British used Jewish people to carry out much of their administration. Iraq's first finance minister, Sir Sassoon, Sir Sassoon Eskel, was a Jewish man. Jewish people were predominant, predominant in developing Iraq's political and postal system. They loved Iraq. They were prominent in Iraqi parliament and the first musical band, I spoke to you about the music, the first musical band for Baghdad Radio in 1930 was mostly Jewish. Christians and Jews were still the dimmy, the lower class non-Muslims, who had to pay a special tax and Jewish people were still restricted in their education and professions. My late uncle Sabir, Zilkronor Ibraha, was desperate to study medicine, but because he was Jewish, he wasn't allowed to and he had to settle for pharmacy. But it was also a very socially unique place, despite all those differences. So on the top photograph, you can see left to right, my mother, Sabiha Abu Dawood, a Jew. Next to her, Selma Anna, a Christian. Her father owned the newspaper called Iraq. Next to her, Suad Hamdi, an Iraqi Muslim. And next to her, the Armenian Araxi Vedrosian. It's not a picture of assimilation, but rather of difference, living side by side <coughs> in friendship and harmony. And look at the way they're dressed. No abayas, and their legs are not covered. They are all in modern dress. And the photo below, 1942, my mother became a teacher. And one of the staff was from a village in Kurdistan. The head of the village, pictured, pictured in the center, you can see her dressed in her special headgear and her long gown. She invited all the school staff, all the staff, for a barbecue. So they all made the trip up north to Kurdistan and had a wonderful day together, Muslim, Jew, and Christian. And look at what the staff are wearing. Again, Western dress, legs showing. I remember reading a newspaper article many years ago um, from Saudi Arabia. It banned, it banned the photograph of a sedate church ladies' choir, the women would have been around age 60. Why? Because their legs were showing. Or maybe at that age in the 60s, at the age 60, legs weren't much to look at, but I don't think it's why, that's why they were banned. But Baghdad was cosmopolitan, and if Beirut was the Paris of the Middle East, Baghdad was its New York. Now, I didn't only hear about Baghdad from my parents. In the early 90s, I interviewed the late Albert Yehuda Zifranol Ibraha. His father's name you might know. Um, Sassoon Yehuda graces the Sassoon Yehuda synagogue, the Safari synagogue in Hoffman Street, East St. Hilda. He was also my father's best friend and his best man, along with Richard Sala, to the right here on the bottom photo. This is a photograph of my father on his wedding day with his two best men, also from Iraq, and Richard lives in Canada today. Um, when I asked <coughs> Albert to tell me his story, I did want to play you his voice. I think it's so important to hear the voice of people who come from the region, but um, I know I dare try. I'm going to try and play the voice, and we'll see if it works. Otherwise, I'll just tell you. I'm sorry. Technology. Give up. I'll tell you what he said. Can you still hear me? He said, I was born in the beautiful town of Baghdad. 
now that you're a war with the whole world. He had a good sense of humour, but the way he said the word beautiful, beautiful town of Baghdad. And every Jewish person I have known described the city with love for its beauty, sitting as it does on the banks of the Tigris between the two rivers. And even though Baghdad was inland, far from any sea, my late mother loved visiting the seaside here. She'd simply park her car and stare at the water, and in all weather, because it reminded her of the Tigris, and she never considered the Yarra a proper river. <laughs> now, my parents never talked to us about the Far Hood. They spoke endlessly about Baghdad, but never the Far Hood. While they spoke with great love of Baghdad, they refused to speak Arabic to their children. And when I asked my mother why, she told me they never wanted their children to be tainted by their sadness. They never wanted, they wanted us to have a clean start in a new country. What was the sadness? They never said, but we felt it. And when they spoke Arabic between themselves, we, as children, felt cut off, but we understood it anyway. And when they spoke Arab, oh yeah, and the great tragedy is, I have to tell you, is that my mother was a scholar in classical Arabic. She loved that language. She loved its poetry, its nuance, its music, its emotive appeal. But she never spoke it or shared that love of it with her children. This is a photo taken of my mother during her last days of Baghdad, 1949. And thank heavens she labelled it. So the family, Jewish people at the time, were not allowed to leave Baghdad. They were not allowed to leave Iran. So the family organised a proxy marriage between her and my father, who was now in Australia. And um, she had to sign the paper to say that Neither she nor any of her offsprings would return to Iraq on pain of death. Um, while she hoped to get the rest of her family out, she only managed to get her sister, my late aunt Suad, who was a wonderful singer, as I said, to Kronara Bracha, and the rest were airlifted to Israel a year later in Operation Ezra and Nehemiah. In my mother's suitcase, she brought the latest Paris fashions, silk underwear, evening gowns, matching shoes, but for all the hullabaloo, I always see her as carrying a suitcase of silence. And it wasn't until she wrote her memoirs with the Makor Library that I was able to read about what happened. And then she could talk to me about it. The Farwood began on the eve of Shavuot 1941. And what is what marks, I think, the best Holocaust books is that they don't just tell you Holocaust. They tell you about the light that came before the darkness. They tell you how good life was in the countries and cities and villages they came from, what was life like with their families. And my mother did the same. So she tells us, before describing the Farhud and her departure, about how Shavuot was actually celebrated in Iraq for over 2,000 years, until that year, 1941, May, 30, May 31, because that's when the Farhud happened. Of course, they read the Book of Ruth and they studied Torah all night. But there was much more, and I'm going to read you what she wrote. It's priceless. It wasn't, well, it was called Shavuot, but they really called it Eid al -Ziyada, the Feast of Visits, meaning pilgrimages. People of Iraq made quite a holiday of this feast and celebrated it by visiting the shrine of Ezra Sofer at Kut, which I've shown you, and um, Tigris and the shrine of Nabiha Skel, that means Ezekiel and the seven priests, and with its accompanying yeshiva and al on the Euphrates, 
where they would be woken at midnight for the special prayer for the Beit HaMikdash, the temple. Both these towns were beautiful, surrounded by orchards and palm trees, and not too far from Babel, the capital of Hammurabi, and in the vicinity where the Talmud Babli was written. The pilgrims arrived in hordes on barges that carried them from Baghdad down the river. The journey itself took a few days and was a source of much merrymaking. Families brought their tambourines and dumbuks, small drums, together with all the food and cooking utensils that they would need for the duration of the pilgrimage. They cooked on deck amid singing and dancing and the festivities began the minute they hit the deck. On arrival, they had the choice of staying at the shrine itself or in the small inns called Khan, strategically placed to cater especially for the pilgrims. At the Feast of Weeks, these towns came to life. They overflowed with visitors, those who came to ask the prophets to grant their desires, and those who came to pray, and those who just came for the fun of it all. Horses, donkeys, camels took up as much space as people and they provided the only means of transport there on land. As these towns were near the port of Basra, they had access to many goods from Persia not normally available in Baghdad. And the vendors made full use of the feast to flog their wares. The shrine area would fill with life and happiness with vendors trilling their voices to the highest notes to sing the appeal of their wares foodstuffs that were truly delectable, that filled the air with their aroma, and all kinds of silks that people took home with them for gifts for those who could not make it, and all was accompanied by the beat of drums and the tunes of the flute. You saw people eating, drinking, clapping, singing, in thanks to Hashem for their prosperity. They sang the Psalms of David or the praises of Halevi, or the glorification of Ibn Ezra with Shalri Baghdad, a popular musical band. On top of all this, the voices of women were heard making their zagrib or tahlil, music-like sounds. I think you'd be familiar with them now. With special movements of the tongue in exhilaration. This needed real skill as not everyone could produce these sounds that were helped along by placing the hands over the mouth and then letting go in rhythmic movements. And it was usually accompanied by spontaneous compositions in honor of the prophets. Charity boxes at the shrine would be filled to overflowing and the poor would have a field day. You have to be happy was the motto of Shavuot. And those who were unable to make the trip to Kutin or Chifl at the Festival of Weeks made sweets, such as Luzina, blanched almonds mixed with sugar and rose water, and lightly baked and sent to those relatives or friends on that close relatives and friends on those days. They awaited the returns of the pilgrims eagerly, looking forward to all the delicacies and goods that would come home with them. <coughs> we just celebrated Purim, and really, when I say these names, we should say boo. It was Nazism that led to the end of the joyous pilgrimages on Shavuot and a lifestyle that had been largely unchanged for over 2,000 years. Fritz Grober, German ambassador to Iraq from 1932. Grober converted to Islam, studied Orientalism, spoke Turkish and Arabic, and set about promoting Arab nationalism anti-British sentiments and anti-Semitism. He trained Iraqi troops, paid out generous sums to army officers and politicians, and gained influence with powerful officers, including the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, whom we saw earlier, and Rashid Ali, the rapid nationalist and anti-Semite, who became prime minister three times. Grober plied the Arabs with seductive blonde German women purchased the National Christian newspaper, serialized Mein Kampf in Arabic translation, which you see here, and modified it by replacing any anti-Arab diatribes with anti-Semitic diatribes. 
He organized for Radio Berlin to be broadcast in Arabic throughout the Middle East so that every morning Iraq woke to those words, Achtung, Achtung. And he established a Hitler Youth organization modeled on that in Germany. He sent their members to Germany for training and they came back fired up about their wonderful experience that they had, shouting in Arabic, long live Hitler, killer of insects, killer of Jews. Robber's reign was an eight year intensive onslaught of anti-Semitic propaganda, anti-British, anti-Semitic and pro-Nazi sentiments grew and began to flourish in the, in the Iraqi population. Uh, April 1941, the coup of nationalist and Nazi sympathizer Rashid Ali, on your right, saw an escalation of violence against the Jews. So the Farhud happened in June, but his coup, April 1941, and already the trouble was starting. There were arrests, hangings, attacks, thefts, plunders. <coughs> it wasn't just the Farhud, it was also the two months leading up to Dr. Maya Sumra, who now lives in Sydney, speaks about his mother's experience of that pre farhood period. <coughs> As a young woman, she was standing on the street and she looked up to see British planes flying by. She was immediately arrested as a British spy, traumatized for the rest of her life. She <laughs> believed she was arrested because she spoke English. But even after living in Australia for many years, she was still afraid to speak English. The Hamsa, you know the Hamsa, we buy them, we put them in our homes to bring us luck. The Hamsa, the hand against the evil eye in blood red, was painted on every Jewish home. An open invitation to raid, maim, murder, the next step in a plot towards Jewish extermination. It was not the red mark of Egypt where the angel of death passed over. My late aunt Suad de Granada Bracha told me that on her way to school one day, she saw her neighbor, a handsome young man, blue eyed, who had a lovely young family hanging in the street. Today is her yourself. And after that, she saw his head was standing on a stake on the gate. Erin <laughs> Shavuot, May 31st. There had been a war for control and also oil, especially oil, between Rashid Ali and the British Army. The British Army was amassed outside the borders of Iraq, and Rashid Ali and his government had fled. There was a power vacuum. Floodgates opened. The words that came to mind to me are Shakespeare's words, let slip the dogs of war. Policemen changed into plain clothes and joined soldiers, louts, criminals, Hitler youth, Nazi sympathizers with their swords, knives, and guns. Jewish people barricaded their homes with chairs and tables and waited with stones and glass bottles. Policemen stood by to watch the massacre. Hordes, like you see here, stormed the homes of the Jewish people. They targeted mostly the poor areas, the meek, trusting people. Night and day, you could hear the screams of people crying for mercy. Body parts were flying. Here you see an image of the Farhud people watching on their balcony. Albert Yehuda, whom we spoke of before, lived outside the Jewish district, over the river. A lot of people didn't know, Jewish people didn't know what was happening, unless you lived right in that central core, poorer area of where Jews lived. And he didn't know, he'd been at the Jewish club, he came home, he got on a bus to come home, and 
And someone stopped the bus, soldiers stopped the bus, they got on the bus, they said to the bus driver, is he, isn't he? And the bus driver said, meaning, is he Jewish? The bus driver said, no, he's not Jewish. And the soldiers got on, and the bus driver pulled that bus as fast as he could to get away from them and cursed them. But he didn't know what was going on. There was no grand an announcement, but when his servant, when he got home, his servant, who was a Jewish woman, married to a Muslim, said to him, Albert, don't stay home tonight. They're killing the Jews. And it wasn't, you know, when we read history, we think this happened immediately, on this day, at this time, and everybody, in, and, and everyone knew. It, it, nobody knew. It was just an eruption, like a sudden <coughs> tsunami. So don't stay home tonight. He and his sister took shelter with their Armenian neighbours. One of his relatives was found lying on the road with knives in his ears. When the family took him to hospital, a nurse warned them, don't accept any medicine. It was understood the doctors would have prescribed him poison. Albert left Baghdad as soon as he could that same year and never ever went back. Many others like him left for India. Others tried to forget and remain in the land they loved, but the fairy tale and the music was over. How did the assault end? Not through the British. They stood by and watched. Their explanation was, <coughs> well, you know, we can't show favoritism to the Jews and we have to get on well with the Arabs. My late mother tells us how it really stopped. She writes, on the 2nd of June, around midday, instead of hearing the usual aftum, aftum on our radio, we heard the voice of the virtuous preacher, al Alama Jalal Ilham Nafi. He should be listed as one of the, what do you call them? The righteous, the righteous thank you, the righteous Gentile. <coughs> He called out on radio, people of Baghdad, I now stand here to warn you, Jews are the people of the book and are under our protection according to the teachings of our prophet Muhammad. <coughs> As we sat in that room downstairs with bottles and stones for defence, we were suddenly relieved and amazed. We knew that was the turning point. It was the turning point, it wasn't quite the end, but it was a turning point. And looting and killing still went on for a few days after. Instead of taking their pilgrimage on barges to the shrine of Ezekiel and Ezra, as they had done for the last 2,000 plus years, about 600 of the Jewish people of Baghdad landed in this mass grave and were denied a Jewish burial. And as I told you before, the numbers really weren't counted. We think there are 600 in there, but the Jewish Heritage Center, that there were in excess of 900 who, who lost their lives. Um, but, you know, that's just, that it wasn't just happening, it didn't just happen in Baghdad. It happened throughout Iraq. And it's a cruel irony that we say Kaddish on Yom HaShoah, Holocaust Day, for the six million using the language of these people who landed in this grave as a direct result of Nazi propaganda and intervention in Iraq. We don't acknowledge them, and it's time we did. I believe that they are being mentioned each now and then in some, some commemorations, but they're still tagged on like a tail on a donkey. Um, I believe my mother had sent this photo to my father <coughs> in Australia, showing him their new home after the Farhood, which they rented for three years. Remember, it looks huge, but it held um, a very extended family, five sisters and their families. I think she was being a little flirtatious with him. It's wonderful that she wrote on the back of all her photos, and I, I must learn from her. Um, she writes, my room is the first next to the balcony. Notice the open window. 
So subsequent to the Falkhood, it was a similar story to Germany, freezing of assets, restrictions in travel, loss of jobs, appropriation of property, accusations of Zionism, communism, hangings, imprisonment, torture. But in expelling the Jewish people, <coughs> robbing them of their jobs, their bank accounts, their goods, Iraq cut off its nose to spite its face. An estimated 150,000 police turned off. An estimated 150,000 Jewish people lived in the Iraq of 1949, with about 90,000 residing in Baghdad. Many held prominent positions in the Chamber of Commerce, the Railways, Postal Service, National Bank. Traders, they were traders engaged in import, export. They were journalists, poets, musicians. Of course, they were also farmers, weavers, fruit sellers, butchers. But a high proportion of Jewish people were employed by the bureaucracy and were linchpins in the economy and infrastructure of the country. When Germany had replacements, whereas Germany had replacements uh, for Jewish people, they had ousted from those jobs, the Iraqis did not. When the Jews finally left, Iraq was in a mess and in a telling tale that came full circle for a community that had been there since the deportation of Babylon, even the music industry collapsed. Some years ago, I met the Iraqi refugee, Amr Sultan, who now practices medicine in Sydney. He told me that when he was a boy, his mother used to tell him bedtime stories, like fairy stories, of how good life was when Jewish people lived in Iraq. The unsung heroes of the Farhud were the Muslim friends and neighbours who defended and protected the Jewish people during the Farhud. They put their own lives at risk, and some died, standing in front of Jewish doorways with their guns and knives to fight off the marauding mobs. Rivka Goldman, whose book you see to the left, was born in Basra. In her book she writes, In Basra, my birthplace, the mob moved from one street to another, from one house to the next, shouting, Mala Yehud Halal, taking of Jewish property is permitted by God. And death was everywhere. When they came to our street and wanted to enter our home, a sheik, our neighbor, stood on our roof and fired his revolver. <coughs> the mob was stunned and quieted for a brief moment, long enough for them to hear the sheik shouting, if you enter this home, you pass through me. Fearing the authority of the sheep, the Iraqis did not dare disobey him, and they spared us. Thus the devotion of a friend saved my family as well as many other people who were hidden in our home. Because the sheep considered my father a friend, he was ready to defend him with his life. On the evening of the 2nd of June, Muslim friends took my mother and her young sister Suad to shelter till it was all truly over. They sent them home with baskets of gardenias from their garden. And my mother also tells the story of her cousin Lulu. Among those whose homes were plundered was my cousin Lulu. Lulu and her mother Hannah managed to escape by hiding in the woodshed and burying themselves amongst the piles of wood. Their neighbor, who knew that they were hiding there, hurried the looters off, saying that he had seen the occupants of the house run away. In this way, he saved his Jewish neighbors. Muslims always aided their neighbors and took great pride in doing so. This was done whether they knew the neighbors of Iraq their neighbors or not, even if they didn't know them. The Muslims were a proud people and considered it a matter of honor to protect their neighbors. On the night of the massacre, many Jewish families were saved, either by being taken into the homes of Muslim neighbors or because the neighbors stood at their doors with guns, ready to shoot. When it comes to remembering the Farhood on Holocaust Day, I ask you something else that we also say Kaddish and include in righteous Gentile commemorations, the Muslims who lost their lives. I'm going to read you um, 
<coughs> this is, you can see it there, Raman Jagan. It's just an extract from his poem about righteous Gentiles. I won't read it to you, I know you're pressed for time. Um, and I want to thank, what? Oh, I want to thank Helena um, because you sent me this article just last night, which you saw in, um, in, in JY. Thank you so much. Uh, so I popped it in here. Um, and this fellow, he wants the Jews back. He said, oh, well, we're really sorry. And, um, and really, we've still got your property frozen. You, you, can, come and, you can come and collect it. But he, he was prompted because a woman, an Iraqi woman in Israel, had told the story of how some Muslims did help Jews save their lives. So I don't know how to go back to that other poem, but I thought it was a beautiful poem, and he ends it. I just don't know this. Try it. Oh, it worked. He ends it. He ends it. Remember, people of Israel, the righteous Gentiles who have placed their own lands, lives in danger for the sake of our persecuted and tortured brothers and sisters, and who were as shining stars in the overwhelming darkness of evil, in the very <coughs> valley of the shadow of death, these men and women stood by our people. And where there were no human beings, they were human. And I think that last line really does say it all. Well, we began with music. I wonder if I can play that. I'd love you to hear that music. Let me try it. singing in Iraq. But the Iraqis in Israel are now making new music. It's a fusion of the old Iraqi style and the modern Hebrew style. And here we have Yair Dalal, born in Israel, of Iraqi parents who left Iraq in 1955. He plays the Ud, an ancient instrument that most likely originated in Iraq. It was certainly most popular in Iraq. And he teaches music to both Israeli and Palestinian children in the hope of creating a better world. So an old instrument, but a new tune. And I wish you all peace and always good music. Now. That was really so amazing. Thank you so much. You did so well. And I think this should be included in the Holocaust education here. Yeah. We should have a copy of that poem to have it when we guide around. I think it's important. Really. Thank you so much. I'm a sound a lot. I'm sure you all did too.